Good morning, beloved. It is good to be back into the house of the Lord. Just as the psalmist David says, as we said in our phase one video, he was happy and glad when they said unto him, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it is with that same heart posture that we come this morning to worship our God in spirit and in truth, to regather as God's people, to make a public declaration to the world that we are not our own, but we belong body and soul to Jesus Christ. And it's his name that we come and we worship in spirit and in truth this morning. If you will open your bulletins, you'll notice that everything you need for your, uh, the service is there uh, written out for you or typed out for you. Uh, our hymns are there, our scripture readings are there, uh, all the things of the sort that you may need uh, to worship are right there in your bulletin. And there are a few announcements uh, that we need to cover. Uh, one announcement is we're going to resume a prayer meeting this Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And so if you feel comfortable in joining us, we will have all the guidelines still in place. Um, and we'll have the proper social distancing, spacing, and uh, sanitation rules followed. But anyway, if you would like to come uh, during the midweek service, please do uh, so that we can lift our voices in prayer together. Uh, also, if you know of anyone in need or if you're in need yourself uh, during this social distancing time, please contact your care group leaders. They will be happy to assist you. Uh, and then also let me give you a brief kind of overview of what's happening in the yard. You'll notice uh, there's no grass and a lot of holes. Uh, they, they have finally finished our drainage project and now they are uh, working on a new irrigation system. And then we will uh, begin to lay sod and, and landscape the whole nine yards. And so uh, bear with us. The yard's ugly, but it will be beautiful one day. Uh, and so uh, that is why the yard is in a little bit of a disarray as you came into uh, the church. Uh, we are pleased that you are here. Please make use of the hand sanitizer as you feel comfortable. Um, offering plates are at the doors uh, here on the communion table. Uh, so please just drop your gifts as you leave. All right. And then, uh, of course, uh, as you saw in your packets, we'll dismiss somewhat like a wedding when we leave. We'll dismiss kind of by rows. Uh, and so that will help us ensure that we maintain the proper uh, guidelines put in place. For now, let us uh, enter into worship. You see your call to worship there actually in your bulletin, Psalm 111, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 9. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright and the congregation, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Indeed, we come to worship a holy and an awesome God, but also one that is gracious and slow to anger. And he comes to tell us through this call to worship, through his word, that we are to give thanks to him and sing praises to him in the congregation. And so let us do that very thing with our first hymn of praise, O Worship the King. Again, it's right there in your bulletin. Let's stand and let's sing together.
Please remain standing and let's go to God in prayer together. Father in heaven, indeed, it is a good thing that you have done to set aside this day as a day for our rest and your worship. And so, Father, we give you much thanks for regathering us back together so that we may find our rest perfectly in Christ Jesus, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth for the marvelous things that you have done for the sake of your people. And so, Father, we pray that our time together will be pleasing in your sight as we commit our voices together in prayer, as we continue to sing hymns of your greatness and your faithfulness and your goodness to your people, as we pay attention to your word, Father, we pray that it would all be glorifying to your name, that indeed you would change us and mold us and make us this very morning look more like Christ, that through our worship together, this foretaste of heaven, we would indeed look more like your son than when we came. And so, Father, with hearts full of adoration, we come asking that you would do this mighty work by your word and by your spirit, that you would change our lives, that you would even change our prayer life and teach us to pray as Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen it is a good thing that we are able to come to lift up our voices and confess our faith together using the apostles creed knowing that we join our voices with the generations past and the generations future but also the church around the world. And so we ask the question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Ruling Elder K. McGirt is going to come to pray for the church and for the world. Let us pray. Father, you tell us in your word how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What a great blessing it is of ours to be able to enter into worship today here in this uh, building, this place that you've gifted us with. Father, we thank you for a president who stood up and said that uh, encouraged houses of worship to continue to meet and to reopen. We ask, Father, that as we come today, that you would take our worship, that you would teach us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We do pray particularly for our pastor as he opens your word this morning. We ask that as he breaks the bread of life with us, that we would partake, that we would taste and know that you are good. Father, anoint his words, anoint his communication with us. We know that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And we claim that Holy Spirit's anointing upon him this morning. We do lift up those within our congregation, within this body of believers who are struggling with health issues. Father, we, those who are waiting on tests, who are uh, undergoing treatments, who are undergoing care right now. We pray for your strength. We pray for your wisdom, for your discernment for them. We ask that you would go before the doctors and nurses and guide them and direct them. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would touch as only you can. You can. Touch them with that balm of Gilead and help them to know thy healing and thy timing. Father, we ask for your strength for the bride of Christ. We know that you will return for a pure and a chaste bride, and we pray for that within, within the church. Father, that you would help us to look to you as the author and finisher of our faith, to, to as Jude challenges us to, to earnestly contend for the faith. 
Father, to stand bold and to stand firm upon the promises that are given to us in Scripture. You tell us in your word that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And that you will keep us in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee. Father, help our minds to be stayed upon thee, to be, to be firm in our commitment to you. As the enemy comes in to, to, to create confusion, to create chaos, we pray, Father, that you would give us that clarity of thought, that clarity of mind, that clarity of communication that only comes from you. We pray for the world, Lord. As we think about the world, we do desperately plead for revival, a Holy Ghost revival, to sweep across our land, to sweep across this world. And who knows, perhaps it's a, the issues dealing with this COVID-19 virus that perhaps you might bring that, Lord, we don't know. But we ask that you would help us to be faithful, to be by that post of duty, to be where you've called us to be for such a time as this. Lord, our hearts desires that we would uh, worship you in a way that's pleasing to you. We ask, Lord, for the leadership throughout the world. We know that there are many who are, Father, that in this time of unrest, who are continuing persecution, who are continuing. We pray for our brothers and sisters in these areas and ask that you would give them strength, you would give them courage to stand up, to be bold in their communication. Father, we thank you for you, that your word is inspired, it's infallible, and it's in error. Help us to boldly stand upon it as a true word of God and to make no apologies for it. We ask that you would go before us, that you would guide us and direct us today. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. If you open your announcements page and look at Psalm 48. Psalm 48 is our scripture text this morning. If you've been keeping up with our sermon series, our brief sermon series on the church and her members, you uh, have realized that we have been going through uh, what are the membership vows of the Presbyterian Church in America. And we have covered those first three vows out of five vows. And as we transition from ver uh, vow three to vow four, uh, it begins to talk about how uh, the Christian life is much more than just a life of Monday through Saturday, but it is a life that is uh, all about the gathered church on the Lord's Day. And so Val 4 teaches us that we are to, uh, supposed to support the church. We are supposed to support the church in our attendance of worship. We are supposed to support the church with being good stewards of our time and uh, being a, a good volunteer, and we are supposed to uh, support the church, of course, with our uh, giving and our, of our tithes and of our offerings. Uh, and then verse uh, Val 5 tells about, teaches us how we are to submit ourselves to the officers of the church. Well, one of the things that is so often the case in this life is that we will not give this revolutionary love to one that we don't have a high affection for. Uh, if we don't care about the church, we uh, will not volunteer at the church. If we do not care about the church and love the church, we will not support the church in our attendance and in our giving. Uh, and, and of course, if we do not love the church, we will not submit ourselves uh, to the leadership of the church. And so I thought it was fitting to uh, follow some sort of a, a rabbit trail and look at Psalm 48 as, a, as really an introduction to vow 4 and 5 of our membership vows. Because here it is, uh, that as the vows transition from everyday Christian life to what the Christian life looks like within the church, it is here that Psalm 48 begins to address why we should love the church. What is Psalm 48 all about? It's about the gathering of God's people in the dwelling place of the Lord. And so here it is, as, as Psalm 48, uh, written by uh, the sons of Korah, it's a song to be sung. It is a song that shows our affection for Zion. Zion, the gathered people of God in the dwelling place of God. 
And so here it is, as, as the sons of Korah write, they are talking about their longing to be in the presence of the Lord. They are talking about their longing to be gathered together with the people of the Lord. They are talking about their longing to feel safe and secure within the house of the Lord. And all of those things right there summarize what these last two months have been all about. We have longed for safety and security. We have longed to be back in the presence of God. And we have longed to be back gathered together as a people of God. And so here it is, if we are going to talk about our, our um, commitment to the church in verse, uh, vows 4 and 5, we should see why is the church worthy of our affection and our support. And that's exactly what Psalm 48 here discusses. And so let's read it together. Uh, you, see, you see it there in your bulletins. Uh, and we're going to read all 14 verses of Psalm 48. People of God, hear the word of God, for it is right and it is good, and it is for you. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful and elevation is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic, they took flight. Trembling took hold of them there in anguish as a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple, as your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let the Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. The grass withers, the flower falls, but our God's word remains forever and ever. Have you ever longed to be somewhere? Have you ever desired uh, so deeply, even within your bones, to be at a place? Maybe it's been uh, a long week at work and you cannot think, I cannot last for one second more until I get to the beach or to the mountains uh, maybe it, it, it's that uh, great concert that you've been waiting for for so long. You bought the tickets three years ago in great anticipation to see the Eagles or something of the sort. And you say, I cannot wait to get there. And you become almost of a, uh, a middle school girl, so to speak. And you're just giddy all inside. Well, very much in the same way, the Sons of Korah talks about the place that the Lord dwells just like a giddy middle school girl. There is a, a swelling up within them to be into the courts where God dwells and God's people are there to worship. They, they long for it in their, their deepest being to be into the house of the Lord so that they may be in the presence of the Lord gathered with the people of the Lord. You know, I'll be honest with you, it's been, a, it's been a long two months, especially for me. I, listen, we've, we've exponentially grew in the last week here, okay? Uh, we went from like two to 30. I don't know how many is here, but we, we have grown in a great deal. And it is, it is a pleasing sight to see people gathered in the church. And we have longed for this day. I've talked to many of you, and you keep telling me, Matt, I missed church. Well, I've missed you. Uh, and, and we have sensed this, this longing to be back into the house of the Lord, unlike anything that we have experienced before, really. And so we come with, with hearts lifted because we get to come to the place where God dwells. We get to come to the place where, where God's people are gathered. And, and we have longed for this day, and I think that's because... Our, our hearts, our souls, want something deep and meaningful and secure and safe 
and we know that we can find it right here. We know that we can find it right here because this is where the king rules. This is where God dwells. Our hearts, as we see in Psalm 48, and if we use the language that he proclaims, our hearts long to be in Zion. For this beautiful, beautiful Zion, as the old hymn goes. And we long for a place that is, that is explained here in these 14 verses. We, we, we long for a, a real, far better, far greater, far more powerful place than this world has to offer. And it is here in Zion. In Hebrews chapter 12 We're told that you have come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and to the heavenly Jerusalem. And and, and automatically our minds go to this psalm because this psalm is painting the picture of, of the beauty of God's dwelling place. And then Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that it's right here. Yes, I understand that, that this psalmist is, is really pushing us overall towards heaven, but, but just as the reformers of old preached, this is a foretaste of that dwelling place that we get to experience each and every Lord's Day. And immediately right there, it has to confront us a little bit because do we treat Sunday morning as a foretaste of heaven? Do we treat the opportunity to come into the sanctuary of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, with the people of the Lord, as an appetizer of the heavenly Jerusalem that we will experience for all eternity? You see, Zion, the city of our God that's written about here in Psalm 48, is is talking about First Presbyterian Church. It's talking about this gathering place where where the Lord dwells. This is a blessed place, a a beautiful place, and this is the place where God is. You actually see that first point there in your bulletin. The the beauty of Zion is that this is where the king is present. This is where the king is present. You know, here it is that that the sons of Korah begin begin to tell us about this great city, this beautiful city. It it, it talks about how this city is grand and majestic in every way. But the reason why it's so beautiful, the reason why we can say beautiful, beautiful Zion is because it is the place where the king is present. That's exactly what it talks about there in the first three verses. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, far north, the city of the great king. And it is here that he has made himself known as a fortress. You, you notice, don't you, that all of, these, all of these natural advantages of this city. Now, if we lived in olden times, we would understand that uh, all the more that, that, that this city is set up for success. It's far north. It's on its own mountain. It, it is surrounded by uh, walls. It has great citadels all around. It, it, is the, it is the perfect place to live. But beyond all that, this is the Lord's mountain. This is where God has made himself known. And, and here it is that this is what the psalmist is proclaiming. This is where the Lord dwells with his people. That is That is the first reason why Zion is so beautiful. It is where God dwells with his people and makes them secure. Because you notice, don't you, all the natural advantages that this city has in verses 1 through 3, notice what it says. God is the mountain. God is the fortress. God is the city. It is here that God dwells with us and makes us secure. And isn't that a theme throughout all of the scriptures that God dwells with his people and God wants to be with his people in the presence of his people with his people to receive the praises of the people. Isn't that a a, a natural flow throughout all the scriptures because you go to the Garden of Eden and the garden is is full of beauty and full of majesty. Uh, Adam and Eve dwell there and, and what is so special about the Garden of Eden? 
that they walk with the Lord, that they talk with Him, that they have communion with Him, that they spend time with Him, that they see Him face to face, and they're considered friends with Him. But even after the fall, the promise is continued to be held out that God would meet with His people. And so throughout the Old Testament, we have things like the the pillar of fire resting upon the tabernacle in the evening of the day. And Moses would enter into the tabernacle and there he would meet God as, as the scriptures tell us. And he would meet God face to face. And he would, he would meet with God in the tabernacle and, and they would commune as friends. And of course, the, the pinnacle of, of God dwelling with His people is there in Jesus where, where Jesus comes and, and literally the Greek says He tabernacled among us. He he. He came in flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and and full of truth. And and we beheld His glory. Glory as the only Son of God, the Apostle says. And then finally, in in, in the new heavens and the new earth, the very end of our Scriptures, Revelation 21 and 22, we see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven And it is there that the Lamb is in their midst. And there's no need for a light in that city because the Lamb is that light. And surrounding the throne is all of God's people and they dwell with Him forever and ever. And so all the way back in redemptive history past and and all the way in redemptive history future, it is a promise that is sure that God dwells with His people. But it's not just a promise for the past and for the future. It's... It's a promise for now. Because here it is that God has promised to dwell with His people as they come to worship Him in the city of God. By His Spirit and through His Word, He he comes and He meets and He speaks to His people and, and, and He sings loudly over us. If you remember that that phrase in, in Zephaniah chapter 3, God through Jesus Christ our Lord sings loudly over us and He's a mighty one who will save. And, and you may not have heard Him while we were singing, O worship the King, but, but the heavens were singing just as we were singing. And this is the place where God is present. He is present by His Spirit. He speaks to us through His Word. And He sings loudly over us in jubilation because we are redeemed people of God. The first reason that Zion is so beautiful is that the King is present here. But also, He is powerful. He is powerful. You see it there in verses 4 through 8, don't you? As the psalmist, as the sons of Korah begin to to unpack for us how, how the enemies of God have have tried to surround the kingdom of God. As they have come to to lay waste of the kingdom of God, as they have come to take the kingdom of God as as their own, they have assembled together, but as they assemble, they are now in panic and they're trembling and they're taking flight. Because not only in, in Zion is the king present, but he is powerful. You notice there in verse 4 and 5, For behold, remember that behold throughout all of the Scriptures is, is telling us to pay attention, to wake up, to see what is about to be said. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded and they were in panic. They took flight. So it says that God is, is so powerful and His city is so protected by Him that as soon as they see the grandeur of the kingdom of God, they, they're in panic and they begin to flee. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Have you ever uh, seen that as, uh, I think the best illustration is, is, is probably Goliath and David. Because as David begins to come into the camp of the Israelites, what are all of the Israelites doing? They're trembling in fear and they're running away and they're hiding behind tents. And, and David says, why are you all running? And then he peers around and he sees Goliath. And, and boy, it sure seems like you should be scared of him. 
in a far greater way, in a far truer way, the enemies of God have assembled around His city. And as soon as they lay their eyes on it, they begin to react just like the Israelites. They begin to flee, and they begin to tremble, and they begin to fall out in panic. It's here that that the, the fortress of God is so strong that they are not even able to attack it. As soon as they see Zion in all of her glory with the king in the midst, you you see the people of God standing firm in victory and the enemies of God taking flight. You know that, that children's song, Our God is so great, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing our God cannot do. You know that song. Uh, that's exactly what is, what is being proclaimed here in verses 4 through 8 of Psalm 48. That that song is true right now for us this morning. And so I don't know what kind of burdens you maybe came this morning with. I don't know what despair you have felt in your heart this past week or depression that you might be struggling with throughout this month. I don't know if you've said this past week that you cannot go a step further in this life. I've never felt like this before. Maybe that's you dealing with this despair and depression and overwhelming. Uh, Maybe it's you that are struggling with besetting sin. Maybe it's you that struggles with rage or deception and, and lying. I don't know the details of what you're facing, but what we do know from Psalm 48 is this. When we come to meet with God in Zion, this is the place where the blessing is held out for you, that you can be free in Jesus. And you can be secure in Him. And you can find your safety in Him. Even if the demons and the devils are shouting in your ear, or whether it's your own heart telling you're not good enough, this is the place where we flee to Jesus and find our refuge in a mighty God. In fact, that's what Luther is actually teaching us through Uh, His well-known hymn, A Mighty Fortress, he says, And though this world with devils fill should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for Him. His rage we can endure, for lo, His doom is sure. One little word shall fail Him. And have you ever sang that song and noticed what Martin Luther does there? He capitalizes word. Because he wants you to see that it is Christ that gives us the victory. It is Christ that is the mighty king who who has gained the victory for his people at the cross. He has crushed the serpent's head and he has won the victory for all of his people. That's why the Apostle John sees it so clearly as he sees the revelation of heaven. He sees us where? He sees us on Mount Zion, standing with God in victory over all of our enemies. It is here that our God, our King, is powerful. It is here that He is in our midst. It's it's here that He allows us to dwell in the safety of His fortress. And it is here that is a beautiful place. Because when we come into this place, we know that we are safely in the palm of our God's hand. And because He is here and because He is powerful, we should praise. That's our third point. Zion is beautiful because here is where the King is praised. And that's exactly what we see here in this psalm. Really, the whole psalm is a song to be sung in praise to our God. But it is here, really there in verse 9, that He begins to say, We have thought of Your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of Your temple. And we cannot remain silent, is essentially what he's saying. He's saying here it is that that we know the grace of our Lord. We know the steadfast love of our Lord. We, We know the protection and the safety that we receive in our salvation in Him. And and now we cannot be silent. He says, as your name reaches the, the whole earth, let Mount Zion be glad. Let us rejoice in Him because He is good, even in His judgments. You see, it's it's really the gospel message coming forth in verses 9 through 11 where where we are getting this proclamation that 
that God is good for His people. He is gracious for His people. And we have thought about this graciousness that we have received. And now we break forth in praise. Because we have thought of your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple, we praise. Our praise reaches to the ends of the earth, verse 10 says. Well, where is the steadfast love of God most clearly displayed? Where do we think to when, when, when praise seems so far from our lips? It is the cross of Christ, isn't it? Because our King is not simply the King. He is the King who suffered for His people. And so when we see the cross, we see the steadfast love of God clearly displayed. We, we see the steadfast and abiding love of God washing all of our sins away. We see the Son of God who bled and died for the sake of His people. And we see the wrath of God being taken in your place. And there it is that we see the steadfast love that is talked about there in verse 9. You see, the, the king rules powerfully from the kingdom of God. And, and, and as he rules powerfully, he invites God's people, his people, to, to dwell with him week by week in the sanctuary of the church. And, and it is here that we recall for ourselves the gospel. It is here that we remind ourselves and we sing about and we pray about the gospel that, that Jesus Christ stands in our place and now we are righteous. Because here it is that we are reminded week by week by week that we have fallen away so many times that we have struck out against His law so many times that we have fallen short of His glorious standards all the time. Yet we are here as God's people to sing praises to His name and to be deemed children of God. One of the pastors that I was listening to as I was preparing this sermon said, there's nothing more mystifying to me than worshiping with, with friends and to see men and women standing in the midst of the congregation and not singing. Because if they had their ears open this very morning to hear God singing over them, if they could hear the angels of heaven singing as they were singing, they would want to join their voice with them. And I think that's very challenging for us because if we know the steadfast love of God, the, the natural flow is to proclaim Him in praise. It is to worship Him in praise. If we love the fact that, that, that the cross and the tomb is empty, but it is our salvation. If we love the fact that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes on our behalf, if we love the fact that He is sitting there and He is anticipating the day that He gets to come back for His people, if we love the fact and we find our blessing in that fact, the natural flow is that we will praise the God who has saved us. You know, that old hymn that I, that I used as the title of this sermon says, Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song of sweet accord and thus surround the throne. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad. Because we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And if that's your heart this morning, if you know the, if you know the steadfast love of God, if you are a child of God, you will sing. And you will sing loudly in praise to Him because we serve a King and we are indwelt with a King and we are dwelling with a King this very morning that has suffered and bled and died and rose again for the sake of His people. And so we join our voices with His voice and we join our voices with the angel's voice and we sing praises. Then lastly, in verses 12 through 14, Zion is where the king is proclaimed. Zion is where the king is proclaimed. Look at it there in verse 12. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider, her, uh, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation, what, what are you going to tell them? You're going to tell them that this is God. Our God forever and ever, He will guide us 
forever. And so here it is that, that the psalmist invites us to walk about the city. He, he invites us to see the, the safety and security that we have in this city. He, in, he invites us to see the majesty of this city and the beauty of this city. And he says, and, and, and as you see it, go tell the next generation. But what are we to tell them? Are we to tell them about the citadels and the ramparts? Are we to tell them about uh, the, the number of her towers? No, we're not to tell them about any of that. We're actually to tell them about God himself. Do you see how it flows from verse 13 through 14? You may tell the next generation, this is God, our God forever and ever. You know, it is a, a beautiful thing to be missions-minded as a church. It is a beautiful thing to be uh, so caught up in, in world missions that, that we pray and we support missionaries throughout the world knowing that there's people who are being saved that we will never meet until we reach glory. But you notice the challenge here, don't you? The challenge is, is to realize the mission field that is right here before us. The challenge is to see in the covenant community that there is a generation who needs to, needs to hear about God and His works, God and His safety, God and His person, God and His eternal care for His people. So what do we tell them? We tell them that God is with us and He will guide us forever. An alternate reading of that last verse is, He will guide us through death itself and to the other side. And that's what we need to tell the next generation. That's what we need to tell the next generation. And how is He going to guide us through the other side? It's through His Son. It's through Jesus, through His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. It is that Jesus died for the church, His bride, His people. And Hebrews 2 tells us that there is coming a day when Jesus shall gather all of His people and will stand before the Father and say, Here I am, and here are the ones that you have given to me. You see, what, what fourteen pushes us to, verse 14 pushes us to understand is, yet again, this is just a foretaste. This is is just an appetizer. And there is, there is coming a day that we will be gathered before the Father and we will not just simply have a foretaste, we will feast in abundance forever. And we'll see the generations and generations and generations that have come before and we will see the generations and the generations and the generations that will come after and we will see people from all tribes and tongues and nations and we will see God's people gather together with all of their hearts, with all of their strength, with all of their minds, with all of their souls, and we will sing together. This is our God forever and ever. That's why Zion is so beautiful. That is why Zion is so beautiful, that we can be gathered together this very morning and we can have a foretaste of what is to come. That is why we are to love the church. That is why we are to support the church and care for the church and submit to the leadership of the church. That is why we are blessed as a church. That we are blessed as First Presbyterian Church, not because we are beautiful, not because we are strong, not because we are great. We are blessed because we have a great king. That we have a beautiful dwelling place of God and we are invited in each and every week to experience his presence to hear his voice, to find safety and security in a world that is chaos. Why is Zion so beautiful? It's because the Lord dwells here and he invites us to do so as well. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, the dwelling place of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this place. And we thank you that this place is a beautiful place where you dwell and you dwell here with power. You are praised here for your might and your grace. And that you proclaim that we are to tell the next generation so that all may know until you return for your people that we are invited to dwell in the presence of our God each and every Lord's day. And so, Father, let us be like the Apostle John as the heavens are open. Let us be in the Spirit each and every Lord's day so that we may so that we may dwell with you, so that we may hear you, 
so that we may enjoy you. Father, let this be the really the, the motive of our hearts that we cannot wait to get to Zion each Sunday. Let us be a people that do not forsake the assembly of the believers, but let us come with much joy in our hearts, singing loudly hymns of praise, for you are a good God who has done good things for your people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit we pray. Amen. It is fitting for us to sing in response. Uh, Glorious things of thee are spoken as to the tune of joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Let's stand and sing together. Again, thank you for being with us. We will notice that our congregational response is the doxology that we know well. Uh, let me also remind you that, uh, that we'll dismiss uh, by rows according to the direction of our deacons. Uh, and then also know that if you attended the 830 service this week, you attend the 11 uh, service next week. We're alternating as we uh, continue through this first phase. Now receive the Lord's blessing. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.